We are in the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, and the last chapter, as it is in a lot of books, is a pretty practical chapter. Uh, last time we were in this, uh, in, in chapter 13, there were just many practical things mentioned, like make sure to show hospitality, care for those who are in prison, uh, be faithful in your marriages, and you know, be content in the Lord. And so it's just a real practical uh, section of the book. And today we're focusing on the Christian life. Uh, and honestly, I think it's the Christian life in community. So uh, I, I know you're here and you're at church, but I, I think there's a, there's a fair bit in this chapter that would, uh, for people who weren't in church, it would be a good way to, to say, what about this text? What, what Doesn't this text sort of point you toward you're supposed to be living the Christian life with other Christians? And I'll just point your attention to a few things quickly. Uh, in, in verse uh, 3, it says, you know, remember them because you're part of the body. And so there's that idea that we are the body of Christ. Christ and, and that we are all connected to each other. And so we have responsibilities to each other. And the other thing that I'll just quickly point to is in this chapter in verse 7 and verse 17 and verse 24, it talks about your leaders. And so for a lot of people who, again, who, who don't go to church anywhere, it's kind of like, well, who are your leaders? It's, it says to, to follow your leaders. It says to, 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 to you know, respond to the leadership of the leaders and, you know, who are your leaders? And again, in, in God's kindness, the Lord uh, gives us each other. But even in a church, there are those in the church who are called to be leaders within that congregation. And that will then be uh, a, at least part of what we talk about uh, today. But it'll be what we talk about again, uh, verse 17 is, is the, our sermon scheduled for next week, and then perhaps again uh, the final sermon. So again, you may not think, and by the way, this is the way some people think. They think, you know what, all I need is Jesus. All I need is to, is to you know, just me and Jesus, and that's enough. And I might show up or I might not, and I'll just figure it all out. Uh, and, and a lot of people do think that way, right? All I need is Jesus, and, uh, and you, may not think I, you may not think I need leaders in my life who are sort of watching over me, because that, that'll be what verse 17 talks about. I don't want to uh, give it away, but 17 says, people who watch over your soul and will give an account. You might think, I don't need that, and all, I'm think, all I want to say is, well, the way you think and the way Jesus thinks differs because Jesus has given you such leaders, Right, so even if you think, I don't need those leaders, Jesus thinks Christians do need those leaders, and he's given them to you. Right? One other passage along this is 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. So he's talking to the elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. We see in that text some of the things we see in, in our passage here, but basically, there's this idea of shepherding the flock and exercising under oversight and so on. And again, you might think, well, I don't want that. I don't need that. But again, the Bible in many different places says, I've given such people to the church and that's what churches need and that's what believers need and that's what the flock needs. So uh, what I want to talk about today, what I think the text it's more important. What, what is the text talking about today? I think it's, say, it's, think it's answering the question why we need the church. And I don't think mainly you need the church as an institution. I think we should think of the church as a gathering of saints, right? Each of us are part of the body of Christ as we, if we, as we are believers. And uh, we gather then with the word of God and with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Lord has given us the church. And why we need the church is that we might be strengthened to live for the Lord. Let me just give you a brief outline uh, and help you see the area I want to focus on in this sermon. Uh, the first point is basically the Lord has given you pastors to teach or, or leaders to teach. It doesn't say pastors, but leaders who teach and, and are examples for you. So you might say, well, that's what we've shown up for here today, isn't it? We've shown up for uh, somebody to teach and be an example to us. So that's, that's covered. And then if we go back to the third point in the sermon today, it'll basically say, and then when you, when you live your life, Live your life to live your life to honor the Lord. So basically, do what the Lord wants you to do and worship Him. And you might think, well, that's great. Well, that's what I do. I did, did that a little bit here. And when I leave, I'll go, you know, worship the Lord this week and I'll live for Him. So I've got I've got it covered, right? The, the points are go to church and have a pastor there and have him teach. And then you know, when you're all done, you know, worship the Lord and live for the Lord this week. And and what I want to focus on is that middle part uh, because. There's, there's a logic to why the Lord wants you to come here, 
uh, and it may be confusing, but I'm going to try to make it as clear as I can. Uh, the reason the Lord wants you to come here is because you need to be strengthened by grace. Right? You, <laughs> you get weak, don't you? <laughs> uh, you have trouble living for Jesus sometimes, don't you? Uh, you, you, have to, you know the right things to do, but you, you have trouble doing that, don't you? And, and I want, I, I, and as, I'm, as we're reading this text, it says, uh, the reason why you need good teaching in church and not bad teaching in church is because you need the kind of teaching and you need the kind of ministry of the Spirit that actually strengthens you in grace. Because you need God's grace to live for God every day. Right? And so we gather in part uh, to preach the word, not just so that you, know, you get your daily dose of, uh, of truth, but because you are, des- I am, I am desperately need, in need of God's grace. And God ministers grace to all of us as we gather together and encourage each other and listen to God's word together and re- are reminded of how wonderful it is that Jesus Christ has made us to be at peace with God. And so that's where I want to focus our time, but we, now we have to, and I've laid it all out, let's, let's, let's start at the top. Well, the, the top is, you need leaders who teach and model the faith, verses 7 through the first part of verse 9. I'm focusing on verse 7 to begin with. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Again, you need good leaders, right? You don't need the worst kind of leaders. You don't need the leaders that are just here just so you think great things about them. You don't need the leaders who just, you know, want to get rich. You don't want the leaders who just have a, are on a power trip. You don't, you don't need that kind of a leader. You need a leader who, who loves the Lord and, and preaches as one who loves the Lord, right? That, that's, that's what kind you need. And, and, and the, the work that the Lord has given to the leaders in the church, and by the way, we think he's talking about elders as we look at the re- descriptions of, of what, uh, what the deacon does and what the elder does. Well, the elder is the one who does the ministry of the word. So I think they're, they're talking about elders here. And what do the elders do? Well, well, they do all kinds of things, but one of the main things they do is preach the word. Let me uh, r- direct your attention to 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. This is a charge to the elders. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. (laughs) Right? So it's a a big, long charge to those who would serve as elders and says, you preach the word. Right? Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. So one of the main work of those who serve as elders to do is to preach the word. I could point again to 1 Timothy 4.13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. So what I do and what any who serve as elders do, we do get the word to you. And the reason why isn't just I need to be a person who gets the word. Uh, we all need to be the people who get the word, Right? So, so we make a team, right? It isn't just like, well, we're here, we don't really need the word, but he needs a place to preach. You know, he needs some people to preach to. No, no, no. In God's logic, right? Yes, we need, you know, I need to, those who are elder, need to do the teaching. But again, you're called to gather because, because we all need to sit under the word, right? And there's other things that elders do, and again, we won't take uh, too much time. But what they, another thing that they do is that they not only teach, but they also are an example. And we, we already saw a text uh, of that when we looked at 1 Peter chapter 5. But let me direct your attention to 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourselves as one approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And again, uh, the unashamedness for uh, the workman is not just that he preaches well, but he lives, lives well. Right? Imagine a preacher who preaches well and uh, lived a terrible life. And as a matter of fact, sadly, we don't have to imagine too much because we, we have plenty of examples of that uh, in our world today. And so what we need, again, from those who are the leaders, are those, and really from everybody, are those who will try to live consistent with uh, the Word of God itself. Now, this by no means means perfection, right? Right? I'm not perfect. I mean, if, you, if, if perfection was required, uh, I wouldn't be a pastor. Nobody would be a pastor, as a matter of fact. So we're not talking about perfection here, but we're talking about a real recognition that, that the Word stands above, the Lord stands above me, uh, and, and that, the, uh, that I'm just not preaching my own ideas, but what the Lord has given us, and that I'm not living just however I want to, but I'm trying to live under the rule of God as revealed in the Word of God, Right? And, and, so, and then when pastors do that well, they can turn to the congregation. Some people don't like this, right? But Paul does this. He does this thing where he says, uh, we, we prayed about it actually, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Be imitators of me 
as I am of Christ, right? And again, he isn't saying, well, I'm the perfect example of what Christ a Christian should be. He's just saying, look, I'm, tr <laughs> I'm trying to confess my sin when I see my sin. I'm trying to honor God in the way that I live. I'm trying to be in the word and, and be fed on the word of God. And, and you should just try to do the same thing. Right? And it's okay to say, be, be an imitator. It doesn't mean that I've arrived. It just means I'm trying to live the Christian life. And again, I want you to be able to look at your kids and say, follow me as I'm following Jesus Christ. Not because you're perfect, because you're not. But you just turn to them and say, I'm just, I'm just trying to. Sometimes, I, sometimes you just see mainly sin <laughs> uh, yesterday afternoon. And I'm so sorry about that. It was a terrible example, and I've confessed it to the Lord. Right? But today... I didn't decide I'll follow up yesterday's disobedience with another day of disobedience. I started today with repentance, and I'm going to try to, uh, by God's help, live the way God wants me to live today. Right? And that, again, is just, that, that's how the Christians are supposed to live. And so, again, Paul uh, and, and Christian leaders ought to be those who can say, look at, look at what we're trying to do here. Again, not perfection, but what we're trying to do here is to live for the Lord, and you should, as it were, try to do the same thing. Paul says it again in 1 Corinthians 4.16, I urge you then, be imitators of me. Well, anyway, uh, what we see then is that there are many examples of faith. Actually, one other example that comes to mind is, is, is Hebrews chapter 11, that whole chapter right? The whole chapter of live like these people, right? And if we dove down into the lives of certain of them, we would say, well, didn't that person sin over there? Or didn't that person sin over there? Well, yeah, they did. And yet still, nevertheless, right? They, by faith, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. By faith, they did live differently than they would have had they not lived in faith. And just notice in that chapter how many times it says, by faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, right? Just all, all the way through it. And again, the, the, the point there that we should get is, how did they live differently? They just chose to live differently? No, <laughs> they lived by faith. By faith, they were united <laughs> uh, to Jesus. By faith, they, were, they stand, right? By faith, uh, they, they are, they're at peace with God. And yet, by faith, they lived differently. So again, the key as we live out our faith before our friends and before our family is not uh, just you know, work real hard to be good. Uh, the, the, the first thing we do is we just sort of confess our sins and confess that we're not good and, and trust in Jesus Christ to be good in our place and to, and to make us right with God and now by faith live differently as the Lord strengthens us to do that. Well, here we are. So far what we're seeing is leaders are those who have faith and again uh, teach the word faithfully, right? They live out their faith imperfectly but in ways that hopefully can be followed. And, uh, and church leaders then are qualified elders uh, who minister the word. So what we don't have is, you know, some people who do the ministry of the word, and while they're busy doing the ministry of the word, other people are over there leading. Right? That, isn't, that isn't a biblical pattern, no. The, the people that do the ministry of the word are those who do the leading. Right? And so that's, the, what we, that's why it says, remember your leaders, those who taught you the word of God, because leading, that authority to lead, uh, goes hand in hand with the ministry of the word. And one person can't have the authority to lead without also taking, at least in the church, the responsibility to minister the word. Well, there we have. And, and then we have to make sense briefly. I need to move on. But briefly, what is this, what's this bit in verse 9? No. Eight, that says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then in verse 9, there's some false teaching going on. What's that all about? Well, I think just to be brief about that, the part about Jesus Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever just means, you know, well, maybe I should back up. There's some evidence about those leaders that he says, remember your leaders, at least in verse 7, that those leaders might not still be on the scene. Right? Now, now, by the time you get to verse 17, the leaders are still there. They've got new leaders, right? But it's possible that remember your leaders, you know, the ones who before, and you might think right now, remember, when, remember that pastor you used to have here? Uh, remember that elder that used to be here who faithfully taught you the word, right? And what I want to, I think the logic here is okay, so those leaders may have come and gone. Maybe they've, maybe they've passed away, right? They're no longer with us, and we miss them, and we're thankful for them, and all the rest, right? But Jesus Christ is the same. <laughs> and so what you'll, what you'll get uh, is the, the Lord will have brought up a new generation of those who love the Lord and preach his word. And, and, and honestly, you should expect as it were the same teaching, right? You should, I mean, if they were faithfully preaching the word, then, then the next generation that comes up, they'll also preach the word because it's Jesus Christ is the same, 
right? And so if, I've, if you had a faithful pastor years ago, and, and by God's grace, I've become a faithful pastor, I'm just going to be preaching as it were the same word, the same gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And we don't have any, anything that fell to the side. I might, I might not have strengths that he had or something like that, but you get the idea. We're, the message is still the same because it's the message that's, that, well, the faith once for all, for all delivered to the saints. And so Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then what about those, those false teachers? Well, it's possible, and that was what was going on here. He's trying to say, you've got not good leaders who teach the word of God to you. They preach the, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There, there are some people teaching bad things and, and you shouldn't follow them, <laughs> right? If they change the gospel, if they, if they, if they misrepresent the gospel, if they, if they, if they uh, teach things that are inconsistent with uh, the faith that was handed down to you, don't follow them, right? And so, so this, is the, this is the setup. The setup here is, um, you know, go to a church that preaches good doctrine, uh, that has good leaders, and so on. That's what you need. That's part of what you need uh, to live the faithful Christian life. We have to move on to point number two. Point number two is when you meet, <laughs> this is where, where, where I am reading it, when you meet, you need grace. You stand in need of being strengthened by grace. And I'm just focusing mainly on verse, uh, verse nine, where it says, don't be led away by diverse and strange teachings, right? So there's bad teaching out there, right? Don't do that because it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, right? If you follow the false teaching, you won't be strengthened by grace. What I want you to do, though, is I want you to be strengthened by grace. You see, you see, the, see the need? The need is if you, got, if you went into this false teaching, you wouldn't be strengthened, and I want you to be strengthened. So you're going to need, as it were, not the bad doctrine. I think his answer here is you need the good doctrine. <laughs> but then you don't just need to be in a place where the doctrine is taught. You need to be a place where the doctrine is taught because you need to be strengthened by grace. Does that make sense? Right? It's, it's not just you need to be in a room where good stuff is preached. No, you need to be in a room because you need to be strengthened by grace. And if you see your need of being strengthened... Then doesn't that change your whole disposition when you show up? <laughs> you didn't just show up for a good teaching that, you know, is just a good reminder and I'm not even sure I needed that, right? That's not what you showed up for. <laughs> you need to be strengthened by grace. And some weeks we feel it more than others, don't we? Some weeks we're like, you know, we're dragging ourselves in here. We, we did, as a matter of fact, we looked ourselves in the mirror and we didn't even want to come. We don't feel so good about how we've been living we're a little ashamed. We wonder if everybody looks at us and knows what we've been up to. Or perhaps we've just, we've just had some other failure or some other struggle or some other way in which we have not been you know, living uh, as well as we'd like to live. And I would say on those days, especially those days, but on every day, you need to be strengthened by grace. You need to be uh, among God's people, and you need to be strengthened, right? And, and the contrast then is this, you know, avoid the false teaching. You need to be strengthened by grace, and it says not by food. Now, what we actually don't really have here is a clear idea of exactly what's going on. So some people say what's being taught here is just the Old Testament, Old Testament mosaic system, right? And some people say, well, I mean, even in the Old Testament mosaic system, there wasn't a whole lot of you know, everybody eating uh, food uh, in some way that strengthened them. So maybe it's not that. And so there's a little dispute about that. And I'm not too worried about that right now. Uh, overall, I think what the author of Hebrews is trying to do is trying to point to in this section. There's a lot of indication that he's pointing to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe even we might just say, He's reviewing a lot of what, he's been what he had already taught in the book. Now that, again, shouldn't surprise you. You come to the end of the book, and he's like, let me just remind you what we've been going on about for these past several chapters. Right? There's a, I think there's a bit of that going on. There's something in here uh, about how uh, what was going on in the Old Testament was a shadow pointing forward to Christ, and yet Christ is the fulfillment of that. There's a lot in here about... Um, about Christ and how Christ is uh, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and Old Testament expectation. So let's try to hop into this really quick. Again, it's, it's likely then, uh, when it says you don't need to be strengthened by food, he's likely referring to that strange 
and diverse teaching that he talked about in verse 9. And again, uh, it, it, it either is that they're trusting in the Old Testament sacrificial system or they're, they're trusting in some hybrid of that that includes, you know, make sure you eat some food. Uh, and again, it's not clear uh, what the problem is. But the solution seems to be relatively clear. Uh, the solution is um, that Jesus is... Uh, the one who makes us right with God. And so let's point to a few verses that talk about Jesus uh, a little more clearly. Uh, one is uh, this verse, verse 11. Let's look at verse 11. Uh, it says, um, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sacrifice for sins are burned outside the camp. Now, what, what is that talking about? Well, it's probably a reference to the Old Testament sacrificial system and, as a matter of fact, to the Day of Atonement. Uh, that's exactly what happened in Leviticus chapter 16. That's, a, that's one of the main chapters that talks about the Day of Atonement. And in that chapter, one of the things that happens at the end of the chapter, after the, after the animal is offered, is that cursed animal is taken outside of the camp, right? So even though uh, what was being offered was uh, presented to the Lord, and even in, uh, even in the tabernacle, the animal itself, the, the one who bore the curse, <laughs> was cursed and was set outside the camp. That seemed to be like the place of, you know where you'd go when, you know, when you were cursed. <laughs> you, you didn't get to hang out with everybody else. You didn't get to be uh, in, in the middle of it. You, you got sent outside the camp. So it was a place uh, to, to refer to something outside of the camp is to refer to uh, one who, uh, who was in fact cursed and one who needed to then be separated from everybody else. So that's uh, what we think the reference is to there. But then what it says about it is, uh, interestingly, it wasn't just the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, sort of, that animal was set outside of the camp. Then he says, but, but wasn't Jesus? <laughs> Didn't he bear a curse outside the camp? Look at verse 12. And so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Again, now what is he talking about? Well, he's, he's saying, well, well, that animal was cursed on the day of atonement. He was cursed in your place. That was, a, that was a shadow of what Jesus would do. But it was a shadow in what way? Well, well because the animal was outside the camp. Well, what happened to Jesus? Well, Jesus was crucified just right outside of Jerusalem, <laughs> right? He went right outside the camp. Uh, Jesus himself was crucified. Jesus himself, it, it wasn't the animal who was cursed. It was Jesus who bore our curse. And so then it reminds us again of, of, again, the true doctrine that the whole book of Hebrews has been talking about. It's, it's not the blood of animals that, that will make you right with God. No, no Jesus himself may, must come and bear your sin in his own body and bear your curse in his own body. And because he is cursed, because he was the one despised and rejected, your sins can be forgiven. So, so there's the, the correlation between the animal who, who bore the curse, as it were, uh, eventually outside of the camp, and Jesus himself who had to be uh, cursed outside of the camp. And so then we're reminded of Isaiah 53, 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And again, we see that Jesus bore our sin. He bore our punishment. He, he, he bore our curse. He was afflicted by God. It reminds us again of the grace of God that comes to us through Jesus Christ. And so then the question becomes, well, what does it mean then? What, okay, so, so the animal was cursed and Jesus was cursed. What are we supposed to do? Well, he says to them, well, then you need to go, verse 14, I'm sorry, verse 13. Since Jesus was outside the camp, you know what you should do? You should go to Jesus outside the camp. Let us therefore go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. And here we're reminded of what we've been learning in the book of Hebrews. One of the things that's been happening in the book of Hebrews is there are some established teachers and they are trying to convince people to skip Jesus, uh, to put away Jesus, and to go back to that Old, uh, Old Testament uh, way of worship. You know, you know, and if, if you were to go back to Jesus, I mean, I'm sorry, to go back to the Old System, you would be accepted among us. But if you stick with Jesus, you will be relegated to outside the camp. You will not be in uh, with us. You see, see, the, see the, the, the trouble here. And again, that comes up a little bit uh, later on. You can look at uh, the sufferings and the opposition that people in Hebrews, uh, the, the, the recipients of this letter received, Hebrews 10, 32 and 33. Again, they were, uh, Christians were even persecuted <laughs> uh, when they came to Christ. 
Remember the trouble that you had when you came to Christ and all the trouble that you, all the ways that you suffered uh, when you came to Christ. And the call here then is, okay, you have a couple options here. Uh, go along with the religious leaders and be fine or stand with Jesus and, and bear the shame because we'll treat you like an outcast if you stand with Jesus. And the author of Hebrews says the solution is clear. Go to Jesus. Right? Go to Jesus. <laughs> Go to Jesus outside the camp. Bear the reproach that comes by standing with Jesus. And again, in our world today, uh, we're not uh, getting anybody to try to, to get us to go to the Old Testament uh, system. We're not trying to get anybody to do anything with us except to get us to stand against God and with the world. <laughs> right? And the world is promising to us, everything will be fine if you stand with us. And I think the call to us is just the same. If you stand with Jesus, you will bear the reproach of the people in this world. And what's the answer to that predicament? Go to Jesus outside the camp. Bear, bear the reproach. Stand with Jesus. Stand with the Savior. Stand, stand with the one through whom you receive the grace you need for the forgiveness of your sins and right standing with God. And stand with him knowing that you will bear the reproach of the world and the world will hate you and oppose you. And your decision still is easy. Stand with Jesus. And so we have a review here, uh, just briefly then, we have a, 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 a review of some of the doctrine taught in the book of Hebrews. And the doctrine taught in the book of Hebrews is Jesus saves, uh, Jesus bears your curse, uh, Jesus alone can save you, and, and it, bulls and goats can't do it, and nothing else can do it, and stand with Jesus, but know that if you stand with Jesus, you'll be opposed. And you'll just have to be fine with that. So that's, that's, that's the gospel that's being reviewed in this section. But now, having said, uh, having established the doctrine, I want to again come back and just hit on that nail that we uh, said we had to do some time with, which was verse 9, which it said, you stand in need of being strengthened by grace. Right? And again, I think the reason why he puts this good doctrine together Right? Good doctrine together with you stand in need of being strengthened by grace is because it's not just the gospel is the way that you received grace way back when. Right? He, he's talking to people who already have the grace of God. So he wouldn't need to say to them, you stand in need of being strengthened by grace, if it was sort of like a one-time, just make sure you get the gospel right, and now you're good the rest of your life. He wouldn't say to people already trusting in Jesus, you need to be strengthened by grace. See, there's a sense in which we come and we receive the grace of God by faith upon our salvation, and yet we need to keep coming back to the gospel and keep coming back to the gospel and keep preaching it and keep reminding ourselves of the truth of the gospel because it is through the preaching of the word and the preaching of the grace of God and preaching about the glory of Jesus Christ that we are strengthened. And that's the necessary strengthening that you need before we get to the last end of this passage, which basically says, now having been strengthened, go out there and praise God and live your life for his glory. Right? And if you've been skipping receiving the grace you need for today and just trying to live for God in your own strength, then, then add this to your routine. <laughs> right? the, the, the meeting together with God's people, the, receiving, uh, the, the reflecting on the grace of God in Jesus Christ, and the receiving, as it were, the grace of God in Jesus Christ week by week so that you are strengthened to go out and live for the Lord throughout the week. Right? In Jesus Christ, we are strengthened week by week. <laughs> and even as we leave this place, we're strengthened because in Jesus Christ, we can approach the throne of grace. Let me reflect a few ways in which we are strengthened and why we are helped by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, you approach the throne of grace. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since you have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, dropping down to verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The reason I bring this up is because some people don't want to pray. Some people are too ashamed to pray. Some people have had such a bad week, a bad month, a bad uh, last several years <laughs> that they're just too ashamed to pray to God at all. And, they, and all they can think about is their failures and how they've just not lived up and how they meant to do better and they just haven't done it. 
And what they need is a heavy dose of the gospel of Jesus Christ that reminds them you never approached Jesus Christ in prayer because you deserved it. You only ever approached Jesus, uh, approached God as a sinner because of Jesus Christ. So stop looking at your life and thinking, well, I deserve to pray today because I have been being a good boy or girl. Say, I don't deserve to approach the throne of grace, but I will boldly do it because I am trusting in Jesus. Do you see how you need the gospel of Jesus Christ today? Jesus Christ is an anchor for your soul. Hebrews 6.19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul, a hope that enters into the innermost place behind the curtain. It's the, it's the picture of you just being tossed around by, by doubts and by, I'm not sure I believe in this, and I, I don't know where my faith is taking me, and, and I started listening to this person, and I'm way out here, and all of a sudden you're, 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 you're anywhere but where you began. <laughs> and who is going to hold you fast behind the veil, right? Jesus is behind the veil. Jesus is the one who has made peace between you and God. That's the picture there, right? And he's holding you fast. So it's not up to you to hold you fast. It's up to Jesus to hold you fast, <laughs> right? So, so we come week by week thinking, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep this up much longer. I'm not sure that I can keep this faith thing going. And you say, no, Jesus will hold me fast. He is behind the veil. And because I'm connected to Jesus, I will not be blown away. I will not lose my salvation. I won't go off in terrible directions because Jesus Christ, he's the one who holds me fast. And again, we meet week by week to grasp hold of Jesus again and to say, as long as I've got a hold of Jesus, he will keep me steadfast, held behind the veil so my right standing with God is secured. In Jesus Christ, you won't waver, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he is who has promised is faithful. So again, sometimes you're just like, I feel pretty good today. No, I kind of feel bad today, right? You're just kind of up and down and you don't really know how you feel. And I mean, I'm kind of happy in Jesus today and then I've kind of been sad and discouraged and I'm not really sure what I'm go what's going on here. And again, <laughs> the, the wavering is us. <laughs> Holding fast to Christ is the what keeps us from wavering. And again, we're just, we're just confronted with the reality that we're not all we wish to be when it comes to being Christians. We, 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 we have not arrived Right? We're afraid to say this to each other because we're afraid if you knew, <laughs> if the other person knew that you sometimes have trouble, like they wouldn't even uh, you know, want to talk to you. And the truth is they don't want to talk to you about their trouble because they have their own trouble. And we just need to be honest about the fact that the hope for every one of us is just clinging however the Lord helps us, clinging by grace to Jesus. Because he's the one in whom we stand, not our not our. Perfect, perfect living out the Christian life, just, just holding to Jesus. We come to Jesus week by week. We come to Jesus day by day because we need mercy and grace. Hebrews 4.16 Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, see, that's, that's the, the clear thing is, you have times of need all the time. I don't know if you know you have times of need, but you have them, right? And so you just go to the Lord and you say, I need grace right now. I, I don't know how I'm going to make it through. Lord, I need mercy because I've been in sin. Lord, I, we come afresh to the Lord, as it were, uh, in, in our mess we've made of things, and we say, Lord, I just... I just need you to remind me of your love. And I need you to strengthen me because this, this past week, I've just been living in my own strength and I've been failing. And so I, I need from you, Lord, uh, the strength that it would take to put the sin away. I, I need the strength that it would take to, uh, to, to recognize that everything's okay, not because I had a great week, but because you are the one who saved me and you are the one who laid down your life. And it's because in you I stand, not because of me. Help me to stop looking at me. I feel terrible. The more I look at me, the, more, the worse I feel. Lord, help me to set my eyes on Jesus. But, but in crying out to the one who's going to help you in your time of need, just recognize that if you have a time of need, join the club. We all have times of need. If you can't do it, join the club. We all need grace that is beyond us and must come from God. And we meet here week by week saying, Lord, I need from you what it will take to live for you this week. 
We gather because our faith needs nourishment. That we might have strong faith to live for the Lord just one more week so we can gather again for another bit of nourishment, another bit of strengthening. And again, our faith is nourished through the teaching of this right doctrine about the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is applied to our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit as God gives us the grace that we need to go through the next days and weeks ahead. We need His help to live for Him. And we need a reminder of the saving grace that comes to us. Our, our sufficiency is not in us. That's what the Bible teaches us. Right? If we don't come here to be strengthened, then, then you walk through your Christian life as if you have the sufficiency in yourself. But the Bible teaches you are not sufficient. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. And if you're having trouble this week living and, and, and blessing other people, the, you know, the Lord wants me to be a blessing to others and I, I barely can get myself out of bed sometimes, right? <laughs> then, then, then minister in the strength that God supplies, 1 Peter 4, 11. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So we gather and the Lord gives us grace for our need and he gives us strength that we desperately have. We didn't have it at us. He gives it to us and now we go out and we bless others somehow. We don't even know how, but it was the strength that God supplied. Philippians 2.13, we know it's God who works in us, but to work both to will and to do his own good pleasure. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.10, by the grace of God I am who I am. His grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I. It was the grace of God at work in me. Right? If, 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 you have, if you've had a few good weeks, it wasn't you. It was the grace of God at work in you. And again, we gather week by week because we need to hear from God. And we need to be strengthened by God. And we, have, we, we have grace that we don't even know that we need. <laughs> And he graciously gives it to us. So briefly as I'm closing, you've heard lots of sermons on the live for God this week part, so I'm going to do it a little briefer today. Verses 15 and 16, Through him then we uh, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share with what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Again, out of the sustaining power of Him giving you grace for your time of need, right? out of that that we receive week by week and day by day as we go to Him, you can worship God and you can live for Him. Not perfectly, right? But you, you, can, you can. You just dare not try to do it on your own. Right? So, so, the, so the verse concludes with, having been strengthened, well, worship Him. Right? Open your mouth and praise His name. All right, Psalm 50, 23, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. Do you have a sacrifice for the Lord today? Yes, it is praise. <laughs> Offer sacrifice. The sacrifice I give you today is praise. Lord, I'm praising you. Right? And this one, the one who orders his ways rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Psalm 107, 22, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell his deeds in songs of joy. May the Lord lead us uh, to praise Him in our singing and, 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 and in our praising to tell others the great deeds the Lord has done. May the Lord stir us up to do that as we reflect on how graciously we've received the gospel again this week. May we praise and sing of the great deeds He's done. And again, briefly then, do good, share, uh, share with others. Why? Because it's pleasing to the Lord. Th then live your life for the glory of God. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Again, today, uh, I pray the Lord drives home to our own hearts. Yes, the need of good preaching and come to church, get the right leaders. <laughs> and, then, and then when you leave here, you know, live for the Lord, praise Him and, and live for Him. And again, I don't, I'm not minimizing those in any way, uh, but I hope what the Lord is is. Uh, impacting our hearts with right now is just how much we stand in need of His sustaining grace. And it's this sustaining grace that can only come through Him. And that we just gather to call out to Him, Lord, we need You. Uh, Lord, we desperately need You and are so thankful 
uh, that we don't have to measure up, but that Christ has, has, has covered over our sins and that in Christ we are secure. And, and Lord, give us the grace we need uh, today because today we are in need. Let's, may the Lord help us uh, to look to him as we gather week by week. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for an opportunity to confess our own weakness, an opportunity to reflect on not only our own failure, but on your greatness, on how you have provided all that is, that's needed for life and godliness through Christ, who lived the perfect life we should have lived and haven't, who died in our place, who raised again victorious over sin and death, and through whom our sins are forgiven. And how that grace came to us on the day of our salvation. And yet, Lord God, in your kindness, you remind us of what we already know about ourselves, our own weakness, and our own need of sustaining grace. Lord, we gather today needing to be strengthened by grace. Needing to be strengthened by what only you can supply. Needing to be strengthened by what we don't deserve and we cannot make a claim upon uh, in ourselves. But you, you in your kindness graciously give what we so desperately need. And Lord God, we are thankful that you are here uh, to graciously give us what, I, what we need to live for you this week. And to hold fast to Christ. And to trust not in our own performance but in what he has done. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to reflect on uh, the preciousness of Christ offered to us in salvation and uh, our own need of coming back to the well week after week that we might receive the grace we need for our times of need. Help us, Lord God, to live um, mindful of our need of grace and then seeking that grace from you. In Christ Jesus, in his name we pray. Amen.